So good afternoon. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Annie Dills and Josh Cochran to our At Home with Literati series to celebrate their recent books, The Lights and Types of Ships at Night and Drawing on Walls, a story of Keith Haring. Uh, you heard me, you may have heard me as you joined, but uh, as a reminder, um, the chat is closed. You're in a webinar. We can't see you or hear you but you can see and hear us and the chat is closed, but you can keep that chat window open during the event as I will be sending links to purchase each book from Literati Bookstore. And if you are watching us later on YouTube, there is a link to purchase books in the description below. You can also submit questions if you're watching us live using the Q&A feature available to you at the bottom of your screen, or I think in some instances at the top of your screen at any time. So anytime you might have a question for either illustrator, please feel free to use the Q&A to submit it. Uh, or if you're watching with a older person and they could do it for you, you can have them do it for you as well uh, at any time. And I'll read a selection of those after some brief readings from each of the books that's gonna happen first. Um, and during the Q&A, which will also feature some live drawing as well. And as a reminder, uh, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com. Thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our events, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this afternoon or this evening or early this morning, depending on where or when in the world you might be joining us from. So again, um, tonight or this afternoon, we're going to have uh, brief readings from both illustrators of their new books, followed by a Q&A, uh, during which we'll do some live drawing. Uh, we'll get to see the talents of each illustrator in action as they answer some questions. So please feel free to make use of that Q&A feature uh, during the entirety of the event to submit your questions. And without further ado, I'll introduce both of our guests this afternoon. Annie Dills is an illustrator and designer from the Bay Area. When she's not working, she's petting her large orange cat and then feverishly lint rolling her clothes, which I certainly can relate to. And Josh Cochran grew up in Taiwan and California. Based in Brooklyn, New York, he works as an artist and illustrator, often painting murals. In 2013, his work on Ben Queller's Go Fly a Kite received a Grammy nomination for Best Limited Edition Packaging. He has a number of side projects and sometimes exhibits his works in galleries. And um, Keith ha Drawing on Walls, the story of Keith Haring is his picture book debut. So they can't hear you, but they can sense it through the power of the internet. Please join me uh, in applauding at home for Annie Dills and Josh Cochran and welcome them to your living rooms. Thanks so much for the uh, amazing introduction, John. Uh, really happy to um, do this uh, uh, reading. Uh, it was nice to meet you too, Annie. Yeah, it's great to meet you too. Uh, and I'm really excited to be partnering with Literati because they're such a cool bookstore. I've like, I've seen the outside of their uh, bookstore and admired it from afar and I've always wanted to visit and this feels like the next best thing. <laughs> the zoom uh the zoom reading visit yeah. that's cool um should we uh jump into it then or uh yeah that yeah. sounds good okay cool um so i guess i will we're, we uh decided we're just gonna go alphabetical um i'm uh here's my book that um that i'm gonna read from drawing on walls um I have a uh, um, PDF that I'm going to read from, um, and just a real quick, uh, I'll hold it up like this, uh, just a real quick um, note about this uh, project. Uh, it took me about um, four years to make it, and I uh, um, have been kind of like working on it uh, as I've been working on other commercial projects, and it was a really... Um, kind of fun project for me because I, uh, the school that I went to at, in California Art Center, um, they had a massive uh, Keith Haring mural there. And uh, that's sort of how I became acquainted with Keith Haring, the artist. Um, 
I I actually didn't really grow up knowing who he was that much, um, but uh, that was sort of like my first introduction to him, and uh, I was just really really blown away by the um, the line work that he had and uh, colors and the shapes and really the energy of Keith Haring. So, uh, without further ado, I guess uh, I will start the. Um, the reading and um, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna start sort of like um, part way through and uh, just to set it up, this is Keith Haring, I think after high school and uh, he's, um, he's at a flea market and he, he discovers this book that uh, really inspires him. So um, here we go. On a trip home for Christmas, Keith stumbled upon The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. After a few sentences, he felt as if the book was speaking directly to him, like a friend. Do whatever you do intensely. The artist leaves the crowd and goes pioneering. So Keith left school took several jobs and saved enough money to hitchhike across the country. He was searching for his next big step and he took the art spirit with him. And here he writes in his journal, the music, dance and visual arts, the forms of expression, the arts of hope, this is where I think I fit in. Art will never leave me and never should. When Keith returned to Pittsburgh, he spent hours in the library reading about artists he admired. He also saw an ex exhibition of enormous paintings by Pierre Alachinsky. Keith was blown away. Inspired, Keith now knew what he had to do to find the intensity and freedom that he desired. There he is on his way to New York City. Keith arrived in New York City and enrolled at the School of Visual Arts. He was 20 years old. One day he found rolls of paper that someone had tossed into the gutter. He unrolled them in the studio at school and began making bigger and bigger paintings. Keith especially liked painting on the floor by the open door where the sunlight poured in. People passing on the street would stop to watch or talk with him about what he was making. Keith loved it. He didn't believe that some people understand art while others don't, or that art should be hidden away in galleries, museums, and private collections. Keith wanted to communicate with as many people as possible. The public has a right to art. Art is for everybody. The East Village was Keith's new neighborhood. With his friends, he formed Club 57, a local hangout in the basement of a church on St. Mark's Place. A few years later, when Keith was 23, he fell in love with a DJ named Juan Dubose. Keith listened to Juan's music while he drew and Juan cooked big meals in their tiny kitchen. Together, they were happy. Keith wasn't earning money from his paintings yet, so he worked as a bicycle messenger, a sandwich maker on 7th Avenue, a bartender at the Mud Club, and an art assistant in a Soho gallery. He even got a job picking wildflowers in New Jersey, but his favorite job ever was drawing with children at a daycare center in Brooklyn. There's nothing that makes me happier than making a child smile. With his artist friend, Fab Five Freddy, Fab Five Freddy. Keith walked through Alphabet City, admiring all of the graffiti. He loved the colors, the size, the fluid lines, and the blossoming of art on the streets where people could see and enjoy it. One night while strolling down King Street in the West Village, Keith heard the thump and beat of music and discovered dot, dot, dot. Paradise Garage. He was mesmerized by the dancers spinning on their heads and doing the electric boogie as disco and hip hop 
rocked the room. For Keith, drawing and painting were like dancing. He called it mind to hand flow. See if you can spot Keith Haring here. One day in the subway, Keith noticed blank panels where advertisements used to be. Suddenly he zipped up the street, bought a box of white chalk, dashed back downstairs and began drawing on the walls. So that is a, a short snippet. Uh, thanks, Annie. Uh, that's a short snippet of uh, drawing on walls. Um, I uh, also wanted to share a little bit um, with you guys some of the sketches that I did just just for bonus, you know, um, just so you can kind of see a little bit of the process. Um, uh, I drew a lot of these uh, on the computer and um, everything was like pretty loose, but uh, I tried to get the big idea down um, if I could, you know, like this is sort of the big uh, dance scene. And some of it got moved around or edited as the process went along, um, but I tried to keep a uh, fun, loose feeling to the sketches, uh, which I would uh, try to replicate um, when I was uh, making the finals. And some of these pages also got cut, but you know, you guys sort of get the, get the idea. Um, and I also uh, um, made the sketches in color as well. So you can kind of see, um, I use this as a, like a, a guide to paint from. Um, overall, it was just really, really uh, fun to get into painting. You know, most of my work I do is uh, digital. Um, so it was really nice to uh, zone out and paint and uh, mix colors and hang out in the studio, which was really, really um, kind of uh, changed my, my whole uh, practice and the way that I think about uh, making art. So um, thanks so much for uh, listening to this. Uh, I guess we'll have a little Q&A after this. Um, I'll uh, hand, hand the reins over to Annie here. Yeah, that's really cool. Keith Haring is such an awesome artist and he's one of those people that has like an equally interesting biography as art. So that's, I, I think that's really cool that it's like a combination of his, his bio and his, his, um, his life his life work um yeah. yeah so my book is called the lights and types of ships at night um and it's written by dave eggers um and dave had the idea for this book i think probably a long time ago he's a big fan of ships and all things ship related and he's my boss and I was chatting with him one day in the office and he just, he just described the idea for the book to me and that he wanted to create a book that was, uh, that captured the, the beauty of ships at night sailing in the Bay. I think he, he lives in the Bay area and, and loves to watch ships um, on the Bay with his kids. And um, so, yeah, so he, he asked me to, to do this book with him and, um, I think my favorite part of doing the whole book was that I got to learn a ton of sh stuff about ships that I, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about ships before I started. Um, so I got to research all of these really, really, really awesome ships and learn about what they do and the types of machines that they use. And like some ships use these exploration um, units that they drop down into the water to map the ocean floor. Um, other ones use like winches and cranes to scoop up a fish and they get like, you know, millions of fish from the, from the sea. Um, my favorite ship of all that I learned about is called a Lampara. And I guess it's an, an ancient type of uh, fishing for shrimp um, in Asia where they light a piece of um, mercury on fire and, and extend it from a, from a pole at the front of their boat. 
And when it bursts into flame, since all of the fish are attracted to light and, and the moon and the sun, they all swim to the surface of the water. And then the fishermen come in with a net and scoop them all up. So that was really cool. It's called Taiwanese fire fishing. Um, and it's like, a, it's a protected type of, of fishing now and only like 50 people do it, pr probably more. I'm sure there's more, but very few, um, far less than before. Um, and the, the book has some fun, like hidden things in it. I won't tell you what the hidden thing is, but another fun thing about the book is the cover which I will show you, which turns into a poster. Um, it's a giant, uh, this is called an icebreaker. I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's a type of ship that breaks up ice so that other ships can follow it in its path. Um, and I think that one is Russia. I think it's like in Siberia or something. So, Anyway, now I love ships as much as Dave, which was really cool. I think that's like something fun about being an illustrator is that you, if you're, if you're illustrating something for writing, you become interested in the writing just as much as the writer is. So now I have a new weird niche obsession. So um, yeah, and I'll show you the book now. I'm excited to read it to you guys. Okay. So are you guys, Josh, are you looking at my, my, uh, my ship right now? Okay, great. Okay. So this one's called a trawler and it's a fishing vessel. You may have heard of ships. They float on water and carry people and things. You may have heard of the sea. It's when water gets together with a plan to surround us. You may have heard of night. It's what happens when earth turns away from the sun. And last, you may have heard of beauty. It's what we call something that pleases the eye so much we ache and say, oh. But did you realize that of all the world's most beautiful sights, there is nothing more beautiful than a ship and its lights on the sea at night? This is true. This is a factual book. And this is a tugboat. Um, they're, they're small but mighty. They can carry container ships that are like four times their size. And here's a container ship. Look at this ship. It's a container ship full of giant boxes of things. On this ship, there are giant boxes of toys and giant boxes of bicycles and giant boxes of oven mitts and basketballs. And this ship is lighted by a thousand lights and these lights are reflected on the to and fro obsidian sea. Has there, any, has there ever been anything more beautiful? No. Maybe there is, maybe it's this. This is a trawler, a kind of fishing ship. Look at its strange arms, look at its strange face. Look at its lights as they are doubled on the water. Has there been a prettier picture? We say no. This one's fun because it's got these cranes. These guys dip into the water and scoop out fish like spoons. This is a row row. Is there anything better than the name row row? Yes, there is something better. And that is the sight of the row row moving swiftly through the water at night. Row rows are named because they carry cars. They roll on and roll off, thus row row, which makes them the best ever of all boats. But no, there's this. This is an exploration vessel. It's de designed to explore unknown oceans, to map the sea floor, to find new underwater species. Look at its round radar unit. Look at its winches and cranes. This is surely the most beautiful of ships at night. And this one's fun. This guy attaches and it drops this, uh, it's called a Hercules. Uh, it, I, think, I think that's what it's called. Um, but it maps the floor so that they can um, explore it. Oh wait, look here, this is a bulker. See it so long and so low. It's built to carry corn and cement and heavy stuff like that. Bulkers are everywhere and they sail at night and with their lights on, the t on, on they go from boring bulkers to something magical and triumphant. 
look, how can you disagree? Forget what we said about all the other ships being most beautiful. This is a paddle wheel ferry boat and nothing ever has been more gorgeously floated in the night. Look at the lights, so many lights. Ferry boats like this were developed on the great Mississippi River and are known for chugging up and down rivers with giant paddle wheels spinning in the back to carry forth all the passengers. Never could there be anything prettier. And I think I'll stop there. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed the, the hidden thing in all of these illustrations, but buy the book and, and see if you can find it. If not, um, yeah. No, no hint. <laughs> no hint. Um, it is, it is something, um, here, let's see. Okay, Josh, let's see if you can find it. It's something that's not a human, but it, and it's not a fish, but it's another living mm, animal. I think I know. I'm not sure. I shouldn't say it though, right? It'll you can say the... it. You can say it. <laughs> is it the, is it the, the sea lion? Yes. You got it. Um, she's, nice. yeah. These are beautiful. Know. Thank you. So cool. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Wow. Thank you both. That was so, 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 so cool. Um, I certainly have questions. I want to remind all of our um, attendees that you can submit questions using the Q&A at any time, but maybe we should start um, doing some fun, see what happens with the whiteboard drawing. And I have a couple questions to start off um, for both of you. So I don't know who wants to start um, doodling first. Um, Does the doodler get the questions? Um, yeah, maybe we'll do that. Or vice versa. Okay, yeah. Um, so Annie, there's a couple questions already here for you. So if maybe if you want to start. Sure. Um, Great. Yeah. Um, and while you're getting started, I will just, I'll ask my first question. So I have a question for both of you individually about style. Because one of the things that I, is really striking seeing you both um, read your books and, and getting a chance to look at them is use of space and um, approach to how the page is filled. And for the lights and types of ship at, ships at night, the really striking thing obviously is light. And we don't see so much um, figures as we see the way light works in, at night, how different there are different kinds of colors. And then we're also seeing something that I feel like must be pretty difficult to try to illustrate, which is the way light reflects off all sorts of different kinds of objects and especially the water um, and like particles in the air, like I know in the bay it can get kind of foggy. Um, so I'm curious about how um, I think all of us who, who, who maybe draw sometimes just to doodle are used to making lines and sketching with lines, but light is kind of a different thing to illustrate. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about as you doodle um, how you how you create light for something like this. Yeah, that's such a good question. I can actually show you while I explain it. Um, can you guys see my yes document? Okay, yeah. So that's true. I actually that was something I needed to learn while I was making the book um, because a lot of my other art is really line heavy, and um, this is more painterly. So I guess drawing light and like atmospheric light, um, you have to sort of build it up by like light to darkest to lightest, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, so just really quickly, I'll show you. And these are a couple of the questions we have too, are, are people asking what medium you used and, and asking if you, if you composed or illustrated the whole thing digitally. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I did sketches in, um, pencil and then I dropped them into Photoshop and painted on top of them. Um, yeah. 
So, and I just used the same sort of airbrushy tool. So like for example, um, I just kind of got it big, bigger to smaller. Oh. And then um, Dave really liked the sort of the lens flare type stuff. So I also did some of these fun, you can kind of see it here in the green. I did these like fun like lens flare guys um, that are kind of like cinematic. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, and then the other thing that Dave really liked was to have a, um, a an origin point and some type of anchor that, um, that was like clearly like where the light was coming from. So I see. Yeah. And, and when you use a program, like a computer program, like Photoshop, you're essentially putting sort of layers uh, on top of layers to sort of build up the composition. Like you say, you're going darker to lighter. And if I'm looking right, it looks like you have over a thousand layers. Oh yeah, wow. <laughs> so, that's so funny. I busted because when I, first, uh, when I first pulled up Photoshop to show you guys, I was like thinking, is there a way that I can hide how many layers I have? Because <laughs> this is embarrassing. Anyone that uses Photoshop is like, wow. Do not Shocking. have that many layers. <laughs> oh well, I, I mean, I'm no, I am certainly not a uh, a Photoshop pro, but but I I think it's impressive just because it to me illustrates how much how much work goes into making, um, which makes sense because it's just mesmerizing the way that the colors shift and um, how watery the reflections are. Um, and it's just really tough to capture light, I think, in art. Um, and that's why some of our sort of like most famous like Renaissance pieces that are able to work with like light on figures are so impressive is because it's such a difficult thing to reproduce. So I was, I don't mean to point out the layers to say <laughs> too many layers, but just to be like, wow, it seems like there's, there's, it's really intensive to, to make it all pop like it does. Yeah, that was... I, I found it easier for me to kind of like, yeah, move stuff around and, and try different things when I had a ton of layers. Also, another reason why I wanted to keep everything on a bajillion layers is because we were planning to do fun stuff with Pantones. Like we were wondering if we wanted to do like this green that you see is a glow in the dark green Pantone that we're mm -hmm. thinking about maybe using for a moment. Um, and then we ended up going, oh, and the blue is a metallic Pantone that's shiny. Um, the red is a neon Pantone, which is fun because it, it, it all like sit on top of the paper um, in a really fun way and they interact in different ways with the paper. Um, but we ended up going with the gold and then silver. I don't think there's silver in this one. I must have turned off that layer, but um, these guys, and you can see another one right here. These ones I kept separate and we ended up using them and they're shimmery in the book. Um, I don't know if you can, if you could see when I first showed you, but um, yeah, so that's cool. That wow. How do you, maybe this is too technical question, but how do you go from making it, you know, work and look so brilliant and vivid on a um, uh, computer screen and what's the process like transferring that to the page you're, you're kind of touching on this a little bit to make sure that you know when it's printed <clears throat> um it has the same kind of striking effect is there are there uh, folks at the publisher who have different printing processes or is there additional um work from the creative team that goes into um making sure that the transfer from your original to the page um, doesn't lose any of its sort of brilliance or strikingness. Yeah, totally. There's, um, I work with a few different people, a couple of different designers specifically that they're like magicians of printing mm. things, working with printers. So we all, none of us had actually done these types of Pantones before. So it was a bit of a, um, it was a bit of a learning thing for all of us. Um, mm -hmm. But we just did, we did print tests and we tried things and you get things back and you're like, well, that didn't work. Um, let's try a different um, thing. And uh, it was also sort of a feat of like Photoshop and 
learning new things about Photoshop because I, I had to separate things into channels, which were like separate from these layers. Um, but yeah, I'm really, I feel really lucky that I was able to, I, we started doing printing tests when we were still in the office about a year ago. And it was really nice to be able to sort of like look at things together at a table and try new stuff. Yeah. So do you think this is a, a avenue you might stay in for future projects? I mean, you mentioned that you, you, you're used to more line-based kind of illustration. And this is, I mean, the, the other kind of fascinating thing is it really is underneath it all, very line-based, right? Because you're dealing with these ships that are very, very geometrical um, and have really interesting angles and um, um, sizes and ways that they're sort of arrayed. And then you're kind of, uh, kind of covering them all with this really this sort of um is the, the light though the ornamenture of the light um but i'm wondering if you you're saying you've learned a lot about the sort of digital process to this if this sort of is kind of uh charting i don't know uh new direction new for, yeah yeah <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you put me back into the pun that i was trying to avoid <laughs> um yeah i think so for sure like I, it's definitely set my style off in a different direction. Um, I wonder, yeah, I, I wonder if Josh can relate to that too, is that like each new big project, it ends up making you kind of pivot in a way in your art style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you, it's nice to uh, build off uh, a project and then, you know, you, you kind of like add that knowledge into the next thing. Yeah, totally. Um, but I was thinking of, like doing another project um, of uh, like windows at night, maybe just something for my own personal, just like fun, um, doing like uh, house windows at night from the street. I oh, found myself, wow. Yeah, like walk and like buildings maybe. I found myself walking around a lot just by myself at night during quarantine because there's like nobody out. In um, And then Oakland has all these really beautiful old Victorian buildings and you can see different how different windows of different houses and different apartments and stuff. Um, so I thought it would be fun to do sort of like an isolated outside looking in type thing. Yeah. Yeah. During this pandemic. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's all I've I've done the past eight months too is take walks. And that's uh, I'm it, it feels weird to sort of like get really excited about and be really mesmerized by looking inside of other people's houses at night and seeing like, <laughs> you know, like what kind of lights they have or how, if they have bookshelves is always the weird thing I'm looking for. Uh, and it kind of feels a little strange, but it is really like comforting uh, too. And someone in the chat says, or someone in the Q and A says, it's a, a great book idea and that it might be called Glow, which I think is a great title. That is a really great title. Yeah, I I agree. It's creepy. I hope I hope no <laughs> one is listening to this and thinking that I'm a total weirdo. But it is. It's like it, I think it's really fun and kind of like um, it's like comforting. Yeah, to see yeah. other people sort of experiencing the same thing as me. Yeah, um, and going about. I just think it's. I don't. It's not like we're. I don't think Annie and I are lingering outside people's houses. <laughs> yeah. But when you walk There's no by, safe crossing involved. Yeah, exactly. When you walk yeah. by from the sidewalk, you might see people cooking dinner or turning off lights or that kind of stuff. And when I'm taking my long walks, I think it's really nice to just sort of be reminded that people are having very boring lives too. Um, so, Annie, you gave us this really exciting behind the scenes look into your process, and I we so appreciate it. And maybe we can switch to. Um, Josh now and Josh I have questions about um, sort of the same thing about style and about approach and maybe if we wanted to try the whiteboard you could well I ask questions and gather more questions from the Q&A um, maybe show us a bit what you kind of gave us a peek at the pre the draft process before those pages are fleshed out but maybe we could get a sneak peek at how you build figures or how you were sort of sketching out figures for um, this project? Because my first question is, is kind of about that. Okay. Um, sure. So asking Annie and talking to Annie about, about her book, um, illustrating her book, obviously the thing that's, that stands out are, is the interplay of light and all of these colors. And the thing that's really mesmerizing about your book and your illustration is that when, especially the page when Keith 
finds that really cool club is the density of figures and people who are on the page. And also when he's finding the um, big roles. Oh, I think something's, I'm just seeing a big thin line on the, I don't know. What's, oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Thing kind of got, it looks like an old Pong screen. Is, the, is it showing up now? No. Oh, it's getting a little wider. There we go. Now it's back. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, there we are. Um, so yeah, the 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 thing that's fascinating are, are the figures, and um, my question is, um, um, you're illustrating a book about an artist who has and keeps carrying such a distinctive art style that mm -hmm. I remember growing up with because it was often included in. I think it was. He did some animated stuff for Sesame Street or something like that. So I remember it being a big part of my childhood. I remember um, that too. Yeah. And so these sort of dancing figures and the action lines. And I was really into it when I was a kid. Um, so it must be difficult to sort of make an homage to that style while also making mm -hmm. it your own. Because there's times when you have to approximate the the characters that Keith drew. But you're not, you don't want to sort of just draw it like Keith would have drawn it. So I'm wondering, yeah. how do you approach the, um, how did you approach the sort of conceptual um, aspect of this book in terms of how you wanted to stylize it? Um, and also just comment again on how cool it is to see it work and to see these um, New York City scenes or these club scenes where you're getting the, um, the sort of real feeling that you get of activity from Keith's um, work and murals, but in a way that's completely in your own style and completely your own. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that process. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess when we were starting um, the book, uh, and I and I totally forgot to mention this, the book is written by Matthew Burgess and uh, published by Enchanted Lion. Um, uh, we had a conversation about, um, I, you know, specifically like not trying to uh, copy uh, Keith Haring's style in the book, you know, also for uh, legal considerations. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I just also didn't want to do like, uh, you know, kind of like a lame version of what Keith was, you know, what, what his art was going to look like. Um, just because I, I really uh, respect his work so much. Um, so instead, uh, we kind of came up with a, uh, uh, this idea to um, create a, a kind of a look for the environment in which Keith was making his uh, artwork in. And I tried to focus my spreads on uh, the environments and uh, you know, the city and the, all the, the things that were inspiring Keith, you know, like the, the graffiti these uh, dance uh, dance parties, uh, his partner. Um, so uh, those were all things that I uh, tried to um, think about. Um, and as far as like style goes, I, I didn't really worry about it too much. Um, I think um, the, the publisher, uh, Claudia, asked me to um, work on this book largely, I think also because my work has a little bit of an overlap with uh, Keith Haring and I was definitely uh, influenced by his work, uh, you know, when I was uh, a student. So um, I just sort of uh, let my work just kind of um, um, live, you know, without like changing it too much, I guess. Huh. Um, and uh, and I and I did a bunch of tests too. Like mm -hmm. I did, I didn't want to like necessarily have my. And actually, I can show you guys some of the paintings. Um, Oh, and actually, let's see. This is uh, this is the mural oh, that cool. uh, I saw when um, I was a student, and it's still up uh, at the school right now. It's right across the hallway from the library, um, and um, these are some of the paintings that. Uh, that I did, and these were all done um, gouache, acrylic gouache on paper. 
Um, this is a uh, sticker, some stickers that I did. Um, and I, I tried to uh, uh, keep the line work, the actual line of um, Keith's drawings uh, pop out a little bit more in the book. So I tried to keep the lines as like pure black or pure white. Um, and I really loved uh, some of these uh, like little vignettes uh, mm -hmm. that happened in the book, you know, where I can like sort of do a painting of a painting. Um, also these, uh, these uh, street scenes of New York City was really fun to do and yeah. like kind of like focus on some of the 80s fashion um, and and also sneak in some like uh, 80s celebrities like uh, Andy oh, Warhol. Oh, there's Andy Warhol, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I try to do Madonna too, the dancing, <laughs> but uh, she was, I'm not like, I'm not really great at uh, likenesses. So that one was like a little bit more difficult. Oh, that's uh, you really can kind cool. of see some of the textures of the paint um and also i wanted to make a book that was like a little bit messy you know i, yeah. I felt like that was like um embracing sort of uh the keith's uh, ethos you know a little bit about uh making art um and i try not to be too um uh fussy about it you know um uh, this is uh oh, the wow. line drawing for the yeah um, Paradise Garage. Dancing. Yeah, sorry, it's like crooked right now. Wow. Um, well, I I love the figures too. That was the other thing that I forgot to mention about the, especially the New York City street scene is, all, yeah, all the fashions and the different characters. And um, it's interesting you hear you say that you wanted your style to just sort of not, not worry about it, but, but let it be its own. But for someone like me, when you work at a bookstore and you touch a, a lot of picture books and you look through a lot of picture books, you see these kinds of traditions of styles. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I love about drawing on walls is that it reminds me of some of my favorite picture books um, when I was growing up or picture books that had a lot of activity on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly like, I mean, maybe the most sort of trope uh, version of that would be like Where's Waldo or something like that but also yeah. like the Richard Scary books uh, like Busy yeah, Busy yeah. Town those kinds of things have uh, and I, I think it's really great when you're young too is there's just so much going on on each page that you can kind of pour over it so I'm wondering this is your first uh, picture book illustration um, project and was that did that kind of just come natural that kind of idea of page layout or um, did you have kind of some touchstones of maybe picture books that you loved when you were growing up or in preparing for this project that you look to? Again, I think the really impressive thing about it for me too, is just that it has, it's, it's very much its own, um, way of, of capturing that, like, oh man, there's so much to look at here. I want to, you know, I think that maybe the most exciting part of reading a picture book when you're a young person is like, stop, don't turn the page. I'm not done looking at all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I, I actually um, uh, was really influenced by the M. Sasek books, you know, like This is New York, mm -hmm. um, those like those books that were all painted in watercolors and they're, uh, massive spreads. And there's a lot of like little moments that happen in it. Um, and uh, let's see if I can go back to one. Um, so I, I, I was definitely thinking about those. I also share a studio with um, uh, Dan Salmeri, who is the uh, um, illustrator uh, of uh, Dragons Love Tacos. Oh. Uh, and also uh, he uh, did uh, another picture book called uh, Baron Wolf with uh, my publisher, um, Enchanted Lion. Um, and he uh, really helped me kind of uh, like as, as far as like have a better sense of what should uh um you know like what goes into picture books like as far as like laying out uh where the words are going to go you know in the sketch phase like those are all uh considerations that um i try to do in the beginning of uh of this process um and uh um yeah, I, I think um, Where's Waldo was definitely like a huge, uh, and Richard Scarry, those were all really big uh, uh, influences for me. Um, I, uh, I also wanted specifically to make a book that was uh, um, different than my commercial work, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I decided to uh, paint it. Basically. And there's, there's a question um, here, <clears throat> will there ever be prints 
from drawing on walls made available for sale. The colors and perspectives are beautiful. Yeah, um, I'm actually having a show with uh, um, Gallery Nucleus uh, in California, and I think that they are going to uh, sell prints of that big uh, New York scene. Nice. Um, and uh, that should be, and also I'm, I'm going to sell uh, some of the originals, uh, and that'll be in uh, January. So uh, um, I'll, I'll post that somewhere on my uh, Instagram. Great. So people who are interested can be on the lookout for that. Well, I think we're closing out um, our allotment of time here. But before we go, I feel like I should ask. Um, uh, someone's asking if there will be a recording available. Yes, this will be on YouTube, our YouTube channel, Literati Bookstore. You can search for it on YouTube um, and it should be up sometime next week. I'm going to upload most of our yet to be uploaded events over the course of a holiday week next week. Um, but I do have one more question, it's sort of the standard bookstore question, if you will humor me, um, but I'll, I'll kind of expand it a bit. Um, we always love to hear, it's not very often we get to have illustrators, let alone two illustrators visit us, um, but we always love to hear what our uh, visiting authors and guests are reading and enjoying in addition to each other's books. If they have any recommendations for our attendees, but of course, I know that I also have a pile of books on my bedside table that's collecting dust. It's kind of hard to concentrate sometimes these days. So if you wanted to expand it as well to things that you're watching or listening to, um, but I see that Annie and Josh are both leaping for books. So it sounds like they've got some ideas. Um, so take it away. Um, the book that I just finished reading that I love so much is uh, it's a graphic novel called Bradley of Him. Uh, and it's uh, written and uh, drawn by Connor Willemson. Incredible book. I loved it. It's just, uh, I mean, it's also like, if you're into, um, you know, really crazy kind of uh, tripped out drawings. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been kind of uh, my recent uh, interest and obsession. I'm, I, I, I'm also, uh, I also just started a book called uh, The Artist's Way, which is sort of about, uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys know about that book too, uh, which is kind of going to be my like winter COVID project. <laughs> Um, and the book that I'm reading or that I recommend is this photographer. His name is Brassai. Wow. Um, it's called Paris by Night. Um, I wanted to try and grab something that was really colorful and fun, but just these black and white photographs are just so cool just um, by themselves. I don't know if you can see. And very uh, evocative of your work uh, in the lights and types of ships at night. Yeah, totally. And what a compliment because... Uh, <laughs> This guy, yeah, he was like a huge influence with the book. Um, these are like, it's like Paris in the 1920s and 30s. Um, just like really pretty things that you could probably still see mm -hmm. like today. You know, they probably look very, very, very similar as they did 100 years ago. So, yeah. Cool. I recommend. Awesome. Well, those are great recommendations. Folks can can search for them at literatiebookstore.com. And of course, you can also get the lights and types of ships at night and drawing on walls from Literati Bookstore as well on the event page that that brought you here this, eve this afternoon. I keep forgetting what time it is, um, but we've come to the top of the hour. So once again, Annie Dills, Josh Cochran, thank you so much for joining us at home with Literati today, this weekend. Um, and thank you for sharing not only these really lovely books, but also the process behind them and a peek into um, your studios, so to speak. So thank you again for being here and, and I hope to have you in, in Ann Arbor. Um, sometime in the not too distant future. Um, but until then, please continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our attendees, please be safe and, and stay well as well. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next event. Until then, take care, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys.